Hello, my proto squids, my embryonic fast boys, my infantile infantry of keyboard spec sheet warriors. It is your boy, your motorcyclist in chief, your new dad because your old one went out for carbon fiber farkles and never came back. It is, of course, me, Yami Noob. We're back with a classic today, a beginner bike tier list. I haven't done this one in a while, boys, because truly, what is better than an ascending list of motorcycles based solely on the opinions of your humble narrator? Need I even waste my time with the list when we know that the Turbo Boost? lives alone in the S rank up in its ivory tower. We probably should. We have lots of Chinese bikes to discuss, lots of new entrants in the category. We had to update this video. So without further ado, the new updated beginner bike tier list for 2023. Today's video is supported by Voom Insurance. I will tell you more about them later in the show. Let's go. Okay, so first up we have the F tier. Do you know what F stands for? Fart. And I'd rather be forced to wear an oxygen mask pumped full of them than be forced to exclusively ride the only F tier bike we have on the list today, the Suzuki GSXR 250. What is there left to say about this bike? If you don't know by now, it is actually close to being the absolute worst possible way you could spend five grand on a motorcycle outside of purchasing two Amazon crap bikes. Are there other total crap bikes I'd include in the F tier, like the ones from those shadowy Chinese conglomerates? But I don't want to bog the video down with endless crap talking when there are so many more beginner bikes to talk about, ranging from perfectly average to impeccably acceptable. And as you guys saw recently, I did get one of those ridiculously bad Chinese bikes. Um, they are they are so bad. They are firmly F tier. Do not get one of those. Moving on to the E tier, we will find pretty much every one of Honda's entry level sport bikes. So the CBR 300R, the CB 300R, and the CBR 500R. These bikes are fine, right? Like, it's Honda. They're never gonna put out a straight trash motorcycles, but the smaller CBRs and corresponding naked bikes are just really lackluster. The CBR 300R is significantly down on cubes from all of its class competitors. The CBR 300R only makes 30 horsepower at the crank, so like 10 horsepower down from the R3 and nearly 20 horsepower down from the Ninja 400. As for the CBR 500R, its shortcomings are even further exacerbated. It makes a teeny bit more power than Ninja 400, but it is simultaneously significantly heavier and more expensive. Over seven grand MSRP is kind of a big pill to swallow for a motorcycle you'll likely outgrow or get tired of sooner rather than later. I love Honda, Honda is great, but their entry level sport bikes are really not where the brand shines in my opinion. All right, so now we're into the D tier. Maybe we're starting to get into that perfectly average realm where these bikes are all perfectly okay. Maybe not the best or most exciting, but they're not all horribly offensive or disgraceful. The first three bikes in the D rank come from CF Moto. Whoa, 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 Yami. You just put Honda in the rank before, and you just put CF Moto on top of them. It's like you just make these just to piss people off. First, people are getting pissed off. We were talking about CF Moto on the channel, and now people are getting pissed off when we don't talk about CF Moto. So, love it or hate it, they're not going anywhere. CF Moto's entry level bikes are the 300NK, the 300SS, and the newer 450SS. And I feel comfortable lumping these all together because they kind of follow the same pattern. They're on par with much of their competition in terms of specs. The 300cc bikes make around 30 horsepower and the 450 makes around 50. They've got some decent tech features and all end up costing a little bit less than Japanese alternatives. But at the end of the day, it is a Chinese motorcycle from a brand that is newer to making motorcycles. So no matter how competitive they are on paper for now, there's gonna be a degree of skepticism. If we've still got 300 NKs on the road in five or 10 years, Cool, they'll have earned their place in the market. On top of skeptical reliability, the general lack of aftermarket support or even just brand recognition leaves the CF Motos in the D tier. Also, their navigation app gave direction in inches instead of miles, so that isn't doing much to instill trust in the company. All things considered, the 300NK, 300SS cost $4,200 and $4,500 respectively, and the 450SS cost $5,500, so pretty good value for money. This one might rustle some feathers as well, but another couple of D-listers are the Royal Enfield Himalayan and Scram 411. I've had no problem with opening my heart and soul to Royal Enfield recently, and I've come to realize that they have some value, but it is hard to not feel like the Scram 411 and Himalayan act more as novelty bikes than motorcycles capable of being regularly ridden in normal use. They've got some really cool styling choices and are good at tracting around on some gravel, but if you've got to regularly go 70 miles per hour, you're gonna start to feel their shortcomings. Both bikes make around 24 horsepower, and while the Scram weighs 410 pounds, the Himalayan weighs even more clad in adventure gear. 
These bikes are good and fine if you have other motorcycles for other purposes, but I don't think a beginner will want to have a Scram 411 or Himalayan as their only motorcycles in the stable. The Scram goes for $5,099 and the Himalayan has an MSRP of 5449 but they do look pretty sweet. Another bike that makes the D list is the Yamaha MT-03. While being fundamentally the same as the R3 with the same frame and engine, but package as an 80. While being fundamentally the same as the R3 with the same frame and engine, but packaged as a naked motorcycle, the MT-03 just doesn't really hit the same. It's a little gutless down low and needs to rev out higher than you'd expect a naked bike would to put down any power. That's the main drawback. With some tuning and sprocket changes, you can make it more enjoyable to ride, but remember, you're not supposed to spend too much money modifying your beginner bike, so D tier it is for the MT-03. The MT-03 will run you just shy of five grand at 4,999 bucks. A slightly better entry level naked bike, but not by much, is the Kawasaki Z400. This motorcycle is also stuck in D tier purgatory. It's like the Ninja 400, but a little bit worse. I don't really like the Kawasaki Z bikes, so sue me. Some people like them, some people also like Ska, so what does that really say about humanity? It doesn't really matter what the Z400 costs, the Kawi simps already stopped watching anyways. And if you're still mad about the Honda thing, stick around, I will redeem you, don't worry. Now before we jump into the C tier, I wanted to take a second to shout out our sponsor, Voom Insurance. Voom is a little bit different than your typical motorcycle insurer because they're a paper mile insurance company. If you're a seasonal rider or you own multiple bikes, you could easily save a ton of money because why pay for motorcycle insurance if your bike is just sitting in the garage? Best of all, Voom doesn't use any tracking software or hardware. Simply take a photo of your odometer and you're good to go. Voom is only available in these states. Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, not real state, Wisconsin, and Tennessee. So what are you waiting for? Get a free quote by using my link in the description and see how much you could save by switching. Thanks again to Voom for supporting the show. Click that link down below and get a free quote. Now back to the show. Wow, and just like that, we're already in the C tier. I think I must be feeling pretty generous today as we have quite a few higher ranking motorcycles. So first up in the C tier, we have the SV650. And you might be saying, what the hell, Yam? You're just trolling us with this video. Isn't the SV650 like the best and most versatile beginner bike ever? Yeah, the SV650 is a great bike, but it is also so ubiquitous now that it's starting to kind of bother me. I'd rather have a bike that checks less boxes but is more unique than an SV650 at this point. And if you're buying a brand new SV650 from the factory, you're essentially buying an SV650 from 2006 at 2023 prices. Yes, I know it was updated in 2017, SV650 simps, blah, 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 I get it. It's still super old. 2006 was like 17 years ago. It's time to go with the program. And if you're buying a used SV650, it's probably from 2006. Look, the SV650 is fine, but I'm feeling a C for today. Without ABS, a brand new 2023 Suzuki SV650 will still cost you $7,399. A secondhand SV can range from two grand to, it's free, just get it out of my garage, I don't have the key to the title because my ex-boyfriend left it here 10 years ago. Also, the SV650 is kind of one of those bikes where I'm like, it's kind of a beginner bike, kind of not of a beginner bike. It really depends on the kind of rider you are. As far as beginner cruisers go, the Rebel 500 is kind of hard to beat. The beginner-friendly cruiser market is pretty underserved, and the Rebel 500 is a modern, good-looking cruiser that makes decent power. But many riders will eventually want a motorcycle that is more sporty or become a true cruiser boy that will eventually realize they need to ride a Harley or an Indian to elevate to peak leather daddy status. So for that, the Rebel 500 is stuck as a C-tier bike. But hey, not a single other traditional cruiser even made the list. It's gotta mean something for the Rebel. The Rebel 500 costs $6,400. $449. Royal Enfield. What a journey we've gone together. Years ago, I refused to even include any Royal Enfield motorcycles on the list, and today I've got two Royal Enfield motorcycles in the C tier. Wow, how times have changed. The motorcycles of the C tier are the INT 650 and the Continental GT. They're essentially the same bike with slightly different aesthetic and ergonomic choices. The INT 650 is more of a traditional roadster, while the Continental GT has a more committed cafe racer stance. Both bikes are powered by a 648cc air-cooled parallel twin that makes 47 horsepower and 38 foot-pounds of torque. Each bike costs less than seven grand, and considering people have been buying brand new iron 883s that make the same power for 11,000 bucks, Royal Enfield really has an opportunity to be the new sought-after machine for someone that wants an inexpensive expensive, low-maintenance, retro-styled bike. 
Now we're into the B tier. The first B tier motorcycles we have are from KTM, one of the most value-driven, budget-friendly brands these days. We have the Duke 390 and the RC 390. Both motorcycles are powered by the same 373cc single that's about as much fun as small displacement engines can be. This bike feels really at home in the naked Duke with its wide handlebar and switchable rear ABS. I really love the Duke 390, but some people will still simp for the fully fared sport bike look in which the RC 390 fits the bill as well. It's also a great little bike we have one as a giveaway bike right now on Amenu.co. It's really sweet. Both bikes have good tech packages, aggressive KTM styling, and a fun torquey engine. As far as an entry-level naked bike or an entry-level sport bike, the KTM Duke 390 and RC 390 are pretty hard to beat. The Duke and RC both cost 5,900 bucks. Another B-tier baby sport bike is the Yamaha R3. The R3 has been the platform that has propelled both myself and countless other riders into the fast boy life. It is a high revving, nimble, inexpensive sport bike that has the iconic R bike styling. If KTMs are too ostentatious for your liking or you're just a proud simp for Team Blue, the R3 is a great entry level motorcycle. The parallel twin engine may be smaller in displacement than, say, a Ninja 400, but isn't a high strung engine revved out to redline what riding a sport bike is all about? The Yamaha YZF R3 costs just $5,499. Now the first bike in the A tier requires a little bit of rule bending as it isn't necessarily an outright beginner bike, although many squids have started on one and are still alive to tell the tale. The Yamaha MT-07 kind of nails the Goldilocks zone for a motorcycle that makes power and yet is approachable and sustainable. At around 75 horsepower, it is not so powerful that it is outright dangerous for the more mature beginner, but not so little power that you'll be itching to upgrade halfway through your first year of riding. The MT-07 is really the only middleweight motorcycle that I feel comfortable adding to the list because of both the power numbers and the price. Other motorcycles in the class may be pushing close to 100 horsepower, which might be a little spicy for a beginner or cost close to 10 grand, like the RS660. Another factor that may prove to be prohibitive for some riders, and that is the exact reason why the MT-07 is on the list and the R7 is not. The R7 is sharing the same engine as the MT, pushes closer to $10,000, while the MT-07 sits at a friendly 8,200 bucks. For the A tier beginner sport bike, the Ninja 400 is kind of hard to beat. If you're dead set on a beginner sport bike, not a naked bike, not a middleweight bike, not a 600, but a completely by definition beginner sport bike, the Ninja 400 is the cream of the crop. It's cheap, available for as little as $5,300 brand new, it's making more power than any other beginner sport bike, it is lightweight, it is nimble and fun to ride and makes a perfect track day toy should you upgrade to something else down your daily. They're reliable, have a ton of aftermarket support, huge dealer network, it is an A tier beginner motorcycle, don't at me. And that brings us to the S tier, the pinnacle of motorcycle society, the best of the best beginner motorcycles. You probably know where it's headed at this point if you haven't seen this bike elsewhere on the list, but it is the Husqvarna, Husqvarna, Svartpelen 401. This bike is essentially the Duke 390 in a cyberpunk scrambler outfit, so all the great things about the Duke applies here as well. Great value, fun, torquey single cylinder engine, and better than the average components and tech. What sets the Sparks Pillin above the KTM though are its style and versatility. Just a motorcycle that looks unlike any other beginner motorcycle and has the opportunity to do some light scrambling if you so choose thanks to its ride height, suspension travel, and skid plate. And it's just cool. It's got personality, it's a motorcycle with its own image, and yeah, the power is on par with a lot of the other bikes on the list, but it's kind of a unique head turner, and for me, it makes it a motorcycle worth pursuing. Now the next two bikes in the S tier are both dual sport motorcycles. Why, you may ask? Because let's face it, in the grand scheme of things, beginner bikes are slow. So if you're gonna have a slow bike, you might as well have a slow bike that's fun and versatile. A slow bike that feels a whole lot more exciting while you're climbing over rocks or jumping over curbs, and a dual sport that is capable of on or off-road riding is gonna hold its value in your stable a whole lot longer than a beginner sport bike or a naked bike will. If you only ride on the street, you're gonna see diminishing returns on your sport bike eventually and convince yourself you need something better and faster. And while a dual sport might not satisfy every need you have as a rider, it is far more likely to stick around in your garage for days you feel like goofing off or having fun instead of just being traded in for a bigger and faster bike. So with that being said, the two best dual sport motorcycles for beginners are the Honda CRF 300L and the Kawasaki KLX 300. I told you Honda would be redeemed, don't worry about it. Both are pretty evenly matched in regards of terms of power handling and suspension. They're both lightweight, modern, and inexpensive. The CRF costs 5,400 bucks and the KLX costs 5,900 bucks. Each bike comes in multiple trims as well, like the Rally trim for the CRF or the KLX 300 SM Supermoto. I really like the Rally. I think that's honestly one of the best options for beginners. That's a sweet 
little bike. The DRZ400 from Suzuki is kind of in the same predicament as the SV650. Brand new, you're paying seven grand for a 20 year old motorcycle. Doesn't really make sense. And every single used DRZ has had the crap kicked out of it time and time again by a 22 year old in an addiction to whippets. So with that being said, the CRF300L and the KLX300 are kind of the S tier beginner motorcycles that are picking up and holding on to for a while. But I have one final S tier bike that will actually get the Honda boys excited. I've saved the best for last here. You ready for it? I talked about this bike in a list a while ago, but I do think the Honda CB500X is one of the best choices for beginners. Now, listen, I said the CBR500R was a super boring, super anemic, super lame motorcycle. You shouldn't get it, it's too expensive, but the CB500X is really interesting. It has a 19, 17 inch dual purpose setup, a 4.7 gallon gas tank, a windscreen, and upright ergonomics. It's kind of like a beginner adventure touring kind of you know, commuter bike. It's way more practical than the CBR500R. You can go down some gravel roads with it. You can chuck it down a twisty set of roads. It's a bike that you could genuinely keep for a very long time. It's built to a super high quality standard. So I think the CB500X is definitely an S tier bike. So somehow Honda was at the bottom of the list and the top of the list, but what do you expect? It's a Yami Noob video. The end. This was a long video, so thanks for sticking with me here to the end. Which bikes do you have your eyes set on? Be sure to let me know and subscribe for future videos. Who knows, we might get your favorite motorcycle for our next beginner bike giveaway. Only one way to find out. Big shout out again to Voom Insurance for the support in today's video. Wait, I think I forgot something. Ah yes, there's the double S category at the top of the tier list. Man, how did I forget this one? There's a bike that I didn't even mention. Can you guess what it is? That's a turbo busa. That's always a turbo busa. Now, see you guys in the next one. Fact, park ranger Roy Sullivan survived getting struck by lightning not once, not twice, but seven times. That's electrifying. Goodbye.